All right. Okay, guys, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Kevin Davis, uh, part time here at Pleasant Valley Fire. I work full time with Gladstone Fire Department, and um, we're going over forcible entry today, which is for my state instructor uh, testing. And today's date is September 27th, and the time is 6 or 1800. And um, this should be going on until probably about um, 20 hundred or so, you know, just uh, depending on how, how we do with the skills and everything. So we're going to jump right into lecture. Um, this is the uh, IFSTA uh, PowerPoint, which is also with uh, the Firefighter 1 and 2 Essentials textbook, if you've already been through Firefighter 1 and 2. So uh, as far as going into the principles of forcible entry, um, what are some of the reasons why we want to do forcible entry? Like if we lock doors, lock doors, potential for fire, potential for victims, um, you know, what have you. Um, so it's uh, used to gain access when normal means of entry is blocked. Um, our goal is that we try to do minimal damage. Um, I have a, a through the lock kit. If you're not familiar with that, it's like a lock picking kit that I brought out. So if you guys want to play with that when you get done with uh, the force entry prop, um, I've never been able to get uh, one of the locks to open. Everybody else I show it to, it's like a little puzzle. They're like, oh, hey, and they crack it open. But I've been sitting there for hours, and I can't figure it out. So maybe you guys can show me what's up. Um, and then, of course, trying to get quick access, So uh, which is for getting into that fire or uh, reaching those victims. So, um, as far as uh, where the force entry, we need uh, to listen to command. That's a tactical decision. Um, there's a lot of factors that play into it as far as ventilation and feeding the fire. And um, at, at what stage of the fire and the uh, yeah, effects of ventilation and uh, the amount of effort to require the force entry. So if we're going like, straight to the A side of the structure, and you know it's a big heavy door or something that looks super expensive but then the back side there's something a little easier for us to, to gain access to I mean that's the importance of a 360 so we don't want to um, overexert ourselves too much when we have a lot of work to do on a fire um, always wait to be ordered to force entry before doing so and um, always you know that's a strong point of communication with the IC uh, they need to know what's happening, especially if you're um, getting ready to do it for uh, fire suppression or, you know, for ventilation purposes. So forceful entry and ventilation, um, what, uh, what are some of the things as far as uh, ventilation and what are some of the things, the tactics that we want to consider when we're forcing a door? I mean, the location of the fire, if it's right inside that door or you yeah. know, whether it's further away. I apologize. I'm going to close this door. Andy's telling the story. <laughs> so, as the, the slide's showing, um, location of opening that adds fresh air to ventilation controlled fire can affect the fire behavior. So especially if we got the strong winds blowing or something like that, I mean, the second we open that access, everything else just comes, follows right into it. Um, so uh, control doors and windows to limit the fresh air. Um, what's a door, have you heard of like door control after you pop open the door? So if you're using like a halogen or something and you get that door popped open, you use that into the halogen and try to pull the door right back to you and try to limit that. Uh, effects of ventilation. Always try before you pry. Um, I've been guilty of that myself. I love smashing things. So um, I, uh, I remember being on one fire and we we're getting ready to start ventilating out and getting all the smoke out. And I was with my partner and he's like, hey, they want you to open that window. And I went with my axe, started breaking it out. And he goes over and he grabs the window sill and opens it up. <laughs> and, uh, there was some choice words after that that I don't think the state wants me to use during my lecture. 
Um, so we always, you know, try to try to use our use our brains for the best possible uh, solutions to our problems. Um, you know, and as far as coming into the lock boxes and the Knox box, I was trying to think. Uh, does this? Do you guys know if the school has a Knox box or anything like that? I can't think of anything that, that has a Knox box here in town. Sure. So I know we're 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 small small entity and we don't have a lot of big buildings or you know uh, maybe the nursing home or something like that but I don't remember seeing any Knox keys on our pumper or anything. So um, over in Gladstone we have a lot of Knox boxes and a lot of uh, you know because we have nursing homes and we have apartment complexes and they are um, they're very helpful as far as gaining that immediate access and then also not, you know, producing any damage. Um, but then there's also sometimes it's like you get one key and it takes you into the janitor's room where you have to get another key to go and open up a box that's full of like 50 keys for all the different apartments and you got to figure out which one you're grabbing. So in those situations, if it's a life or death, you know, we, we try to at least use Noxbox to get through. but. You know, if we're having trouble finding a key and grandma's not breathing, then I'm <laughs> sure the door's going to get booted open. Um, so it may allow for quicker entry. Um, information information may be stored on uh, pre instant plans or CAD, CAD data. Do you guys know what CAD is? It's a like, computer-aided dispatch. And it uh, comes on like an iPad, and it gives you like your, um, uh, your street address. It gives you a map. Um, in like say for Kansas City uh, Metro, they have it where they even have um, pre plans and floor plans on their on their CAD data. So the the battalion chief will have somebody driving them out while they're able to check through the CAD and see what the floor plans like and start building their tactics on the way out. Pretty cool stuff. Um, so. Uh, forceful entry considerations, doors and locks, proper tools, security, security barriers. If we're looking at something like this, uh, this is going to be terrible as far as trying to trying to get open. This is going to be heavy duty, but you know we got saws to be able to. That looks a lot easier as far as being able to cut through the rebar. But something like this, um, I'll, I would definitely have to get up there and see you know what you know it's going to take to be able to get that open. Uh, the tools described in this chapter are not intended to be a comprehensive list of all tools that may be available. So one of the things that I want to uh, focus on also is the, the tools that we use here on our pumpers. So like our uh, married set, it's a Halligan and a, and a pick tool. So that's something that we're going to be working with. And then also, you know, doing the, doing the exercises with the, with the flathead axe and, and all that. So. Um, there is going to be a quiz at the end of this, and um, so as far as some of the review questions, what factors must be considered when deciding where and how to perform forcible entry? So what we were kind of going over, the IC tactics, um, ventilation, um, they really didn't talk about victims, but that's something else that we can bring up. And then also try before you pry. What structures in your jurisdiction might pose difficult or unusual forcible entry circumstances? So like I was going on about um, the school right up here, um, I think that would probably have some heavy-duty doors, you know, probably some locks that we would have to cut open. Um, the nursing home, it seems like their doors are open 24-7, but if there's anything that's, you know, if they had to lock down for whatever reason, I could see that posing. Um, is there any, like, say, like, uh, private residences that you can think of that have like you know big solid doors like the big oak doors. No. I don't think so. Okay. Something that's uh, that's good to do on like say like medical calls and whatnot while well, you know the medics are getting them loaded up. Like I love it when I'm riding backwards or I'm doing my you know I'm driving the pumper that day because um, while the medics are doing their stuff and you know, patient care, I kind of get to look around the house and, you know, check out the doors, check out the roof and everything, just kind of building up the building construction. So as far as the forcible entry tools, what are some of the tools that we have on our pumper that, that we, 
we already talked about two of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, the pig, the married set with the pig, the flathead axe, um, pickhead axe, um, Halligan. Halligan. Um, oh no. We have New York hook, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. And a New York hook definitely is helpful as well. So, uh, always wear appropriate PPE when using forcible entry tools. And then the four categories of forcible entry is our cutting tools, our prying tools, pushing and pulling tools, and our striking tools. Uh, cutting tools, um, so that's our chainsaw and our um, K-12. And, um, and then I think we, we have a sawzall as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then a sawzall would be helpful as well. Um, there are some things to consider as far as using um, the cutting tools, and um, it's you know trying not to use it on uh, the material it's not designed for, or you know watching out if it's damaged. And then also if like your partner is using it and it looks like they're going to hurt themselves, step in, you know, be the be your own safety officer and help them out. Um, we have uh, cutting torches over at Gladstone. Um, I have yet to use them, but it's kind of cool to say we have cutting torches over at Gladstone. <laughs> um, bolt cutters and uh, rebar cutters. And of course, do not use a cutting torch in a flammable atmosphere. Um, some of our hand saws, um, keyhole saws, dry, drywall saws, hack saws. And then, of course, your power saws, circular saws, rotary, reciprocating, um, and a chainsaw. So for power saws, uh, the, there's different types of power sources. you got your battery packs and um, gasoline and then electricity. And then um, we got to know our SOPs and when we're going to use, when we're going to use the saws. Again, that's another thing to consider um, IC and the supervisor what they're wanting you to use. Um, wear appropriate eye, ear, hand, and foot protection when operating the power saw. So basically just throwing on all your, your PPE and never force a power saw beyond, beyond its design limits. Um, I watched a guy cut a nader bolt. If you know what a nader bolt is, it's on a car. It's the hinge that connects um, the door to, like basically like locks it in. Then I saw him use the sawzall to cut a nader bolt. It took him, took him like a long time, but he was able to finish it up. So, <laughs> sparks from cutting operations can cause additional fires. Have a charged hose line or portable fire extinguisher close at hand uh, during cutting. So again, that's you know um, a given if you're you're near that situation where you're going to be using the uh, forcible entry to to get on the fire attack. Uh, never use a rotary saw to cut the shell of any storage tank that may contain flammable vapors. The blade guards on some rotary saws are not designed for use with carbide tip blades. Be sure to that the saw is designed for the blade's use. So prying tools, this is the stuff that we're going to be working with today. Um, so it's we're opening doors, opening locks, opening windows, moving heavy objects. And then um, this is where the tactics come in, and um, you know we uh, we get to borrow North Kansas City's forcible entry prop just about any time that we want, and it's all muscle memory. It's just getting in there and just doing it again and again and again, and you know so that when the time comes and you're actually needing to get that door open quick, um, it's nice to have that muscle memory in place. So. Uh, Always push away on your direction of force. Never pull towards yourself as far as getting yourself stuck in between the, the door and the halligan. Um, you know, you don't want to uh, end up injuring yourself. Um, so these are the different types of prying tools that you'll find on certain fire apparatus. I worked on an ambulance where we used to have this, this guy, and it was a lot of fun because the handle disconnects and with those forks and it turns into like a spot where you can just jam the forks in place 
and then you can loosen it up and it turns into like a whole like lever where you can just push it, uh, pop it down and cut into things. And um, it's, a, it's kind of a cool tool. It's not useful on a fire truck, but on a rural ambulance, it was nice to have. Um, hydraulic rams, uh, definitely use those with consideration. Um, I've seen those used on the apartment complexes, like kind of like the, the real like stick frame apartment complexes. And they start pushing, pushing it open, and the whole wall starts kind of like wanting to give out. So <laughs> we definitely had to stop ahead of that. Uh, pushing pulling tools. So we got our um, all of our uh, pike poles, uh, New York hooks, um, and our drywall hooks. So you know, we're going to be working with a sledgehammer today as well. I think I saw one out there by the prop. We'll just, uh, you know, take out our tools and see what we want and play around and um, finish off that door. So have some fun with it. <laughs> the traditional irons is the flathead axe and the, the halligan bar. Um, but as far as having your own married set, it's department specific. Um, I think it's kind of cool that we use the pig, you know, instead of a flathead axe. Um, I mean, we'll see when push comes to shove how that's going to work, but it's we always know that we have um, our flathead axes in access whenever we need them as well. So, uh, as far as some of the things that we were going over, what are five of the most common tools used for forcible entry? Number one, flathead axe. Flathead axe. Halligan. Halligan. Pickhead axe. axe. New York hook. New York hook. Crowbar. Crowbar, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the improper use of tools, you know, is something that um, that we need to be aware of because your body is your career, or you know, as far as even you know, on the volunteer side of things, you don't want to put yourself out of work for getting hurt with something on the job, and. You know, we do this to um, help others, but then if we're in a, like a little situation where it was just a simple mistake and you hurt yourself, you know, that's I've been out on back injuries three different times, and so I don't suggest it at all. It sucks, but um, none of them from as far as forcing a door or anything like that. They're all ambulance accidents. Uh, strain sprains, fractures, abrasions, lacerations. Um, so that's why we always wear appropriate PE, PPE. Um, we only use undamaged tools, so definitely getting out there. On, um, I'm guilty of it. I've really been wanting to take care of that pig. I've been wanting to get some of that rust off of it. Um, but uh, it's something that's definitely on your downtime, uh, going through and checking out your tools and making sure that they're cleaned up. Um, uh, and using, your, using the right tool for the job. You only use the tools for their intended purposes. And positioning yourself so your weight is balanced on both feet. So having that athletic stance and being able to um, use your full body mechanisms, your core and everything, so you're not throwing out your back. Uh, ensure you have, have room to operate the tool properly. Um, we don't have any garden level apartments or anything like that. Those are some of the more difficult ones, and when I say garden level, they're the ones where it's like a, a stairwell, a little tight stairwell goes down to like an apartment or a basement door, and those ones are, um, I've only done simulators on those where they had uh, boards set up and like you were kind of in a tight spot and you had to go force your door that way, and uh, it, you could get the job done, but it's, it takes a lot of effort. Be aware of sudden release of energy when the door or wall is opened. Ensure other personnel are out of the immediate area. Be aware of the environment to prevent gas or vapor ignitions. So like they were talking about with the saws and sparks and things like that. Um, tool safety. Uh, make sure your tools are secured. Repair or replace damaged tools immediately. Um, do not strike a tool's handle. Um, and do not use a prying tool as a striking tool unless designed to do so. So that's one of the 
things why we just go we go through in our practice and our muscle memory so we know that tool and all of its um, uh, all of its potential and um, safety with the power saws match saw and blades to the task and material to be cut never force a saw behind it beyond its design limitations always wear full PPE and fully inspect the saw before and after use. Uh, again, don't use the saws in the flammable atmosphere, uh, especially with like your, you know, your chainsaws up on the roof and everything. Just watch out for your gas emissions. Uh, maintain situa situal awareness, situational, gosh, maintain situational awareness, uh, and then you know keep the people out of there that don't need to be there. You know who loves kicking in doors before we get there. Police. So, yeah, it's our brothers in blue. They <laughs> they love kicking in the doors. They don't have the door control or anything like that. And um, you know, get them out of there. You know, we got this. Thank you for your help. You know, we're we got this now. Follow manufacturer's guidelines for operations. Keep blades and chains sharpened, and be aware of hidden hazards. So, what are some hidden hazards that we can look out for? Electrical lines. Electrical lines, yeah. Definitely. Um, use only blades approved for your saw. You know, so don't go up and use making making up your own saw blades. Um, startle cuts at full RPMs, and store blades in clean, dry environment. Store composite blades with where gasoline fumes will not accumulate. What actions can a firefighter take to stay safe while performing forcible entry? Situational awareness. Perfect, yep. What are we going to be gowned up in? <laughs> PPE. Uh, having your eye pro and your shield down and all that. Um, explaining how to carry a forcible entry tools. Uh, so your pickhead axe having your hand over over the back end of it, up underneath your armpit, um, our combined tools, hold it in a spot where, you know, because those get kind of heavy and all that, so you're not pulling on your shoulder or anything, and the pike pole, having it on the ground so you don't spear somebody on accident. Um, your striking pole and your power tool, so striking pole basically being your sledgehammer, And, um, and as far as the way that everything's carried, we just basically, we're trying to do it in the safest manner. Uh, describe how to clean and maintain forcible entry tools. Uh, tools will function as designed if properly maintained. Tool failure can result in delays, injury, or death. Always follow manufacturer's guidelines and your department's SOPs. So, um, Something as far as just our own considerations is when we go through and we do our truck checks is uh, trying to find out like if somebody had a fire the shift before or if they had a pop a door or something, going back through that tool. And because if they had a busy shift, a lot of times you'll still find drywall on it or, you know, a, you know uh, just something damaged on it. And you want to be able to take care of it and make your tools pretty. Uh, wash with mild detergent, then rinse and wipe dry, check for damages or cracks, check tightness of the, the tool head. Uh, inspect it for all the different, you know, things like your, your chips and spurs, uh, cracks. Uh, replace your axe heads when required, file cutting edges by hand, uh, so they don't want you using, you know, the, the um, grinder or anything like that to be able to <laughs> Even though it's a lot faster, <laughs> but also they don't want you to um, sharpen it too too hard or too sharp because you can end up getting it jammed or stuck when you're um, chopping it or something. Uh, never apply paint to the cutting surface of a of an axe head. So that just means at the the front edge of it where the sharp part is, um, you don't want to have the paint on that because. It'll create uh, stickiness. Um, plated surfaces, uh, so that's like the, the head of your axe, about how to clean it. Um, 
use metal files that will remove spurs, do not make blade too sharp, and do not use a mechanical grinder. Um, so he's using the emery cloth and steel wool to remove dirt and rust. Um, do not apply, apply oil to the striking surface. Do not paint the metal surfaces. Inspect metal for chips, cracks, spurs, spurs. Why must forcible entry tools be regularly cleaned and maintained? So they don't fail you. So they don't fail you. Yeah, that's our that's our livelihood. And then also, you know, if we're having any victims or anything like that, we want to be able to be proficient with our tools that work. Um, so as far as you know, uh, resulting in damage, as far as the when we do our forcible entry, again, try before your pry. If there's a less expensive way to be able to get that door open, you know, if it's uh, like a well-being check or something like that, and, um, you know, not like a, a blazing fire or something like that, then, um, you know, we want to try the, the easiest entry and the less expensive of an entry. Landlords love it when you do that. so. Uh, provide a way to open doors without forcible entry, mounted at high visibility locations, and then uh, using a master key on our Knox box. Uh, door control, critical during forcible entry, ventilation profile change can adversely affect fire behavior. Um, firefighter station at the door to control, and only prop door open if closing the door would block egress. So like that's if like you got a writ or like a fire attack team and you're you're doing writ or something like that. Uh, gaining access to the property. Uh, there's all different types of fences and gates and uh, fencing hazards. Um, out in the I, I used to I cut my teeth in a lot of like rural firefighting and uh, rural ambulance. And something to that farmers hate is when you uh, cut their barbed wire, or, you know, and they find out like three days later why their cows are leaving the property. Um, cut, come across electrified fences, but have never been hurt by them. But I know some people who have. And then uh, watching out for the recoil when you're cutting the fence, you know, where it has the snap back. Electric shock can result if cutting electrified fence before de-energizing them. So, depending on how how high that uh, electricity is flowing, you know, you might you might uh, get a little bit of a ride. Uh, forcing gates and fences. So, uh, rotary saws and butt col bolt cutters. Um, there's other ways to do it too. Um, they don't have them in these slides, but. Uh, we got to do a forcible entry class, and they were showing um, that you're just using like the pick of a halligan, and if you got your uh, like your your traditional lock in the loop of the lock, you could put the the pick of your halligan, and then hold it tight, and then somebody could come up with a sledgehammer or, or a flathead end of an axe, and be able to shatter the lock that way. It was kind of a cool class. They had a, a big bucket of locks from Harbor Freight that they got donated. A bunch of these cheap little locks and we just got to tear at them. Uh, some gates on commercial sites may be provided with special padlocks and or electronic key switches that are operated with the same key used to access the lock box. So this is where, you know, we can play with the, my through the lock kit. It's coming into coming into these. Um, Mortise locks, centrical locks, rim locks, and high security locks. Uh, Mortise lock, latch and lock, this is the anatomy of it. Um, so there's the, the lock bolt. If it's bolted, uh, you really can't use a shove knife or anything like that. Um, so there's ways to pick it that they talked about, but there's also other ways to get by it. Um, by, you know, might have to cause a little bit of damage. Um, there's, if you get get a chance, the guys over at KC Rescue 9 host an amazing through the lock class. And um, there's the, if you do like the full day class, uh, they teach you a lot as far as lock picking. They have 
um, big boards with just locks in place so you can see how everything's built up and the anatomy of different locks. Um, you feel like a, a burglar at the end of it. And so, um, and then so cylindrical lock, uh, tubular deadbolt 